I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater, All of the Moving Parts, a chat with theater pundits on potential must-sees as Broadway gears up for the fall season. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to Theater All the Moving Parts. Joining me for a stimulating look at Broadway's fall season are critics Helen Shaw of The New Yorker and Adam Feldman of Time Out New York. Also, Jan Simpson, theater journalist and host of the Broadway radio shows Stagecraft and All the Drama. It's fall, and with fall, a new season on Broadway and off-Broadway as well. There's a lot to cover, six new musicals, one revival, uh, 12 plays, five revivals, including Take Me Out, which is coming back, and among those are five Pulitzer Prize winning plays as well. So let's jump right into it. Uh, Jan, among the musicals that are coming this fall, what are you most excited about? K-pop. Oh, all right. <laughs> K-pop is the uh, musical that is using K-pop music. And some K-pop stars, and it was, I think, at Ars Nova. That's correct. Um, before, and I didn't get to see it. Uh -huh. um, so I'm really excited about seeing it. And what I heard was that the audience went from room to room when it was at Ars Nova. So I'm interested in how they're going to translate it and when they transfer it to Broadway. And I'm also interested in what audiences it's going to bring because that music is so popular. It's an all, nearly all Asian cast as, Just about. as well, mm -hmm. and it's a large cast. And they're doing the Circle and Square Theater, which leads me to believe that they are going to have them move all through this fictional um, factory. Labor, uh, it's factory. a factory. It's yeah. a music factory. factory. Mm -hmm. Both of you saw it, and both of you, I think, reviewed it. Yes, I, well, I, I did not review it. I did, did not. review okay. it, um, and, and I liked it very much uh, when it was off-Broadway, but it was very much a peripatetic audience experience when you were seeing it there. It was in different locations around this complex, and you went from place to place. You were in small groups and having intimate experiences with different uh, groups of the cast. So I, I'm very curious to see how they're going to adapt that to even a non proscenium theater like Circle and Square, uh, they're going to have to make a lot of changes to make it into a Broadway show, and I'm very curious how that's going to go. Had you, were you familiar with uh, K-pop music prior to seeing it, Helen? Uh, a bit, but part of that came from knowing the people who were putting the project together. One of the reasons I didn't review it is because I have a conflict of interest there. Um, I do, though, think that that question of who is aware of K-pop music has changed so radically since they first produced it. Hmm. So the sort of dramatic question that the production was asking originally was, why is there this incredibly virtuosic, prolific uh, form so beloved by most of the world, and yet it has not broken through in the United States. And they would literally ask the audience that question. And, uh, you know, the, the obvious answers came to hand. And yet now, you know, BTS is the biggest group in, in the universe. I, you know, I think that my, my parents can probably hum uh, butter quietly to themselves, <laughs> you know, and so there's no they're, they will have to adjust that dramatic question or refine it at least, and I'm excited to see how they do that. Your famous parents from Kansas, yes. I might add. <laughs> yes, they, uh, they feature in all of my thinking. <laughs> Adam, what are you most excited about in terms um, of musicals? For me personally, because I have seen K-pop and Kimberly Akimbo in their previous off-Broadway productions, I, I like both of them very much, but I am excited to see the ones that I haven't seen yet, and for me, that means almost famous.
Cameron Crowe has adapted his own movie uh, with help. Um, and uh, I, I'm curious, I, I really like to go into something not knowing almost anything about it. In this case, it's a new score, it's a new script, and I, I'm very curious how it's going to turn out. By Tom Kitt. Uh, the score, the music is by Tom Kitt. music yeah, is and, by Tom Kitt. I saw it at the Old Globe in 2019, and it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's uh, terrific, I think. It's very witty. The book is great. Uh, it veers a little bit from the film, as all musical adaptations need to, but I think that it's probably going to uh, cause a lot of excitement on Broadway. Yeah, well, all of these, you know, well, I'll let Helen answer the question, but one interesting thing about these new musicals is all of them are, to some degree, familiar to us in different ways, uh, and we can get to discussing that. Great. Helen? That's a tricky question, because again, some of them are known properties. I'm excited to see Kimberly Akimbo again. Uh, I think maybe 1776, uh, because they are mm -hmm. taking big swings with the casting. Uh, they're going to make a sort of statement cast. They're they're re-envisioning it as, you know, instead of the founding fathers, everyone will be played by um, either a, a female or non-binary performer. This, this is interesting and exciting, I think. I think also because I have a kind of nostalgia around 1776. It's one of the first musicals I ever saw. Uh, and so there's a little sort of, it scratches two inches at once, which is sort of forward looking, but also maybe backward looking. I, I, I say that, however, I, I am, um, I think maybe really if you dig down into my the, the, the treasure box of my heart, it's really seeing Kimberly Akimbo again. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed it so much the first time, and I think I, I'm looking forward to seeing it again. You both mentioned Kimberly Akimbo, so we should probably go in, I, into that a little bit. Obviously, it, the music is by Janine Tesori. It is based on a play by David Lindsay Bear, a uh, previous play, and he has adapted it into a musical. And it is uh, about, with Victoria Clark playing a 72-year-old woman, even though she's a teenager because she has this disease that has caused her to age prematurely. Well, technically, she's she, playing a teenager like who, who has the body of an older right. woman. So yeah, she, she is, whoever she is, 16 or 17 in the show, but her body looks like the body of uh, Victoria Clark. Uh, and so this is a high-concept idea, uh, but I think it metaphorically in a way it speaks to questions of aging that a lot of people of all ages in the audience can relate to and how your body or, 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 or illness or anything really where your body is not who you think of yourself as being when you look at yourself in the mirror. And so I, I think it taps into those questions in a beautiful way. It's a very funny, I saw the show, the original show mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago and uh, it, I was, I didn't know how they were going to be able to make it into a musical. Uh, and I think they've done a lovely, lovely job. It's directed by Jessica Stone, uh, one of many women directors who are part of this uh, fall season as well. Uh, and it features, uh, it, it's a rather crazy family as well with some great performances, including by Justin Cooley, who's a young newcomer, mm. who bonds with uh, the Victoria Clark mm. character in a beautiful Yes, way. and Bonnie Milligan, uh, <laughs> whom you may remember from Head Over Heels, and she's yes. hilarious in this show, playing a crazy aunt who comes in and shakes <laughs> she, she really is. Even just the memory of it makes me laugh. Uh, when but it also gives uh, Victoria Clark a chance to shine. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't think since Light in the Piazza, she's had a chance to just show her full range, and she's really wonderful. In wonderful, it. Mm -hmm. wonderful. I think that the 1776, which you brought up, Helen, is worth going into a little more because it seems like such a radical reconceiving of the musical, especially because Sherman Edwards, who wrote the music, and Peter Stone, who wrote the book, their estates had to give permission for it. Why do you suppose the estates said go ahead with this radical concept, Jen. 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. Um, I'm open, but I don't know that. It, it seems to me that it, like uh, Suffs um, last season, are trying to go down that Hamilton road mm-hmm. um, to, to sort of reconceive um, history, broaden it, and I don't know. The first time it's done, it's, you know, it's remarkable. And then when it's done again and again, I don't know. What do you think, Adam? Well, I don't know if it's that radical a revision. It's just, it's, it's gender blind casting um, for a lot of these parts. I mean, they're doing 1776 and 1776 has been done before. They did a revival of it, you know, in, in, the, in this century uh, on Broadway. And uh, it was uh, perfectly fine, but it's 50 years old and it's starting to show it seems a little bit. And I think this is a, a potentially very interesting way to shake it up, do the original project, but give it a kind of contemporary twist and a kind of a, some interest inherently from the new version of the casting. But I don't, I don't get the impression that they're completely rewriting the show unless they're mistaken. Helen, you mentioned that it, that it was sacred, quote unquote, uh, to you in a way only because you have a history with it mm, and, mm. and when you were younger. Mm. Um, do you feel at all all what you want them to continue to do and not mess with as well as reinterpret oh, the show? Oh, 100% no. Uh, you know, I having seen it when I was a kid means that the opinions that I formed about it were childish. And so I'm eager to form some adult opinions around it. Uh, I have no illusion that what I thought about it when I was... Um, a little muffin uh, was particularly <laughs> sophisticated or useful. So I think it's more that there are these atavistic pleasures of hearing things that you heard so long ago, you almost don't remember the first time that you heard them. Mm-hmm. And so some of that is just hearing songs again that I heard when I was, was long before I had started forming conscious opinions about the theater. So I'm kind of excited for that. I am not, I, I, I don't have any attachment to it as a text, and if they want to go run roughshod over it, may they may they have a merry time. As Adam says, I don't think they're going to. I think it is purely a uh, the, the most experimentation they're doing is is through casting. Directed by da- Diane Paulus, yes. with an assist from somebody it, else. Yeah, it's being co-directed by being someone co-directed. who has a history as a choreographer, Jeffrey Page. And that's not really a dance show. Um, Maybe now it is. <laughs> <laughs> but unlike Helen. I saw the original production, and then, of course, they filmed it. And they filmed it with the entire original cast. Slavery clause has got to go. Franklin, what are you saying? The issue here is independence. I watch it every 4th of July. Mm. Wow. So, wow. And, and so, has it aged? For me, no. Okay. But maybe, maybe for others. That's and quite so a... maybe it is time to do what they're well, saying. Also, I find if, if I love a musical that I was attached to in my childhood, sometimes the more different the production, the better for me because mm. it's not competing in my mm-hmm. head mm-hmm. exactly with mm. the version that I already know and love. Um, <clears throat> which can be a danger when you do something too faithfully. It ends up being just sort of a bad version of your favorite mm, version mm, of it. So mm. y- I think it's important if they want to keep these works alive, and I, I imagine that's what the estates are feeling as well, right. y- you have to mix them up and make them fresh f- in a different way. Otherwise, you might as well just go and listen to the cast, cast album and watch mm. the movie. And watch mm. the movie. You're looking forward to, s- to hearing Sit Down, John? Are that, you, Helen? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. The classics, the classics. Good God, what in hell are you waiting for? Thomas, for God's sake, listen to me. One of the things that I loved about the original production, I, I didn't see the original production, I'd have to say a revival that I saw, was that Peter Stone's book, for which he won a Tony, I'm sure, and the musical won a Tony as well as Best Musical. One of the things that I loved about his book is that even though we knew how it turned mm. out, there was this sense of suspense 
as to whether it was actually going to turn out. That is really very clever writing. And in one of the critical reviews that I read when it was in Boston, they said that the new interpretation of it, or the, the revision of it, uh, kind of robbed us of that suspense. So hopefully there will be something I don't know, else. it's an unusual book. If I remember it correctly from seeing it the last time I saw it, it stops cold for more than half an hour in the book scene. Like it, it goes in a, a, longer than any musical that I've ever seen without, without a having song. a song. Yeah. So there, it's a very booky show. And I, I don't know, I mean, maybe they have to do things to adjust that. Maybe there will be a dance break. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> a dream bower. <laughs> Another new musical is Anne Juliet. My loneliness is killing me. Juliet plunges Romeo's dagger into her heart. What if Juliet didn't die? That should almost be the start of the play. Hit me, baby, one more time. Since you be gone, I can't breathe for the first time. I'm so moving on, yeah, yeah. It's a retelling and something of a feminist retelling of Romeo and Juliet. What do we know of it? Oh, does anybody, had anybody seen it? It's based on the songs. It's a jukebox musical, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not a bio musical. So we do have one of those coming. We have a Neil Diamond bio musical coming. Mm. But this is not that. This is one of those shows that builds a, a, a new show around an, an extant uh, group of songs. And in this case, they're the songs of Max Martin, yeah. uh, who is an enormously successful songwriter producer. 25 or, number one pop hits. Right. So a lot of pop hits from the past quarter century and you get things like, you know, Hit Me Baby One More Time and I, I mean just a lot of uh, very famous songs. Uh, and they've been knit together in this new story set in Elizabethan times. Uh, and I, I, I've actually heard really good, surprised things about uh, the quality of this show. People I know who have seen it elsewhere uh, have been very enthusiastic about it. So I'm trying to keep my expectations low, which is always a game. Mm. But uh, people have been very charmed by it. The concept is that Anne Hathaway, who's always gotten a rotten deal in history, uh, has rewritten Romeo and Juliet. That Juliet doesn't die, she continues to survive and then mounts a play within a play in which she has all these uh, rather feminist uh, adventures. Uh, so it may be that it's a lot, it, it seems to appeal for the sixth crowd, which of course seems endless uh, <laughs> so far. Or the Moulin Rouge crowd. I mean, people love hearing songs that they know. At Moulin Rouge, there was as much applause when the song began as when it ended because people were applauding. I know that one. <laughs> so I think, I think it will have the same kind of attraction um, for people and Juliet. And, and they've, uh, obviously it was in the West End, but it's an American cast, I believe, or maybe a mix of the two, including Stark, uh, Paula, Paolo Zott. I Did know. I pronounce well, that? Uh, shot? Send it shot. Shot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I stand I, corrected. Yeah. Paolo shot and Stark Sands, yeah. uh, along with Betsy Wolf and Lorna Courtney. Um, now, Anne Hathaway was Shakespeare's wife? Yes. Good. Yes. Good. I was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Check. I want, of course, it. which of course in her will, she only got a bed. So maybe this is some kind second of best. Revenge. Second best. <laughs> the second but best bed. For those of us, though, who have been watching as we go through the, the recent sort of pop culture reevaluation of what we as a culture did to those 90s. Uh, stars, uh, the way that we behaved around the very women who performed these songs when they were hits, the way that we helped in the destruction uh, and, and real pain of uh, what happened to, for instance, Britney Spears. It is such a, uh, it is amusing to me that we have now taken those songs which are associated with some of our least feminist action as a culture and we are pretending that we can put them into a feminist story. Um, 
I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I, I have friends who have seen it, and the moment that they open their mouths to say anything about that, I, I put a bag right <laughs> over them. You know what I mean? Uh, they were uh, whisked away in a black van, so I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I do think that that is a, is a touch, touch ironic. And, and do you feel at all that trying to recalibrate this in the way that you just described is often successful, uh, are setting themselves with a target on their back uh, in this way, or do you have any opinion about that at all? I just saw a play last night called Remember This, the Jan Karski story? I'm not sure. The lesson of, lesson, the lesson lesson of Jan Karski, yeah. in which he says, uh, human beings have an incredible ability to ignore things. Mm. And we <laughs> will, it will be ignored. All mm. of that, all of that dissonance, it will not be a problem. People will hear, hit me baby one more time, <laughs> and they will say, there is a feminist anthem, and they will have no trouble with that dissonance, is my prediction. Well, we're always talking about the willing suspension of disbelief when an audience comes into a theater. Mm. You know, and the external factors that we discuss so often among ourselves bear no relationship to, to what happens when people to their are expectations in exactly. and, and how they're sitting there. Exactly. They just want to be entertained. One yes. of the new musicals is Some Like It Hot, mm -hmm. with a score by Mark Chayman and Scott Whitman and a book by Matthew Lopez and Amber Ruffin. cool pastoral scene with rolling hills and woods of green. It's heaven sent to pitch a tent to Bill and Coo. Some like the warm Hawaiian climb where one can really take one's time and hit the sack in a grass shack just made for two. Some like it nippy on the ice cause then the sheets are paradise. Keep rubbing hips until your lips stop turning blue. Now, it's been tried before, a musical version of Some Like It Hot, the famous Billy Wilder. It was called Sugar, Sugar yeah. in the early 70s, I believe. So we'll start with the critics. And how big of a target is on it? It would seem to be difficult to adapt this movie because the movie itself seems so perfect. And so it's sort of, it's hard to know what it's going to gain through a musical adaptation. Also, I don't know about you guys. I think that Broadway, for various reasons, has turned towards shows about men in drag uh, a great deal in the past couple decades. And uh, we may be exhausting that well of movies about men in drag that can be adapted into musicals. Um, they already have done one, as this you is, say, of, yeah. of, this, of this particular property. They're revisiting it. But it is a delightful, well-constructed story. These are talented artists who are working on it. I think the challenge in navigating a lot of this stuff is that our sensibilities about gender are changing so fast that you know things that a few years ago would have been considered progressive are now considered by some people regressive and finding a line about that that doesn't also rob it of the comedy is a real challenge so i'm curious what they're going to do mrs dalfire ran into that buzzsaw uh helen um <laughs> in terms of men playing women uh, and do you feel that that's a they, problem here i mean I don't know if if Buzzsaw is right because the sort of the pushback for both of those pieces, um, which was it's very profound, that pushback, you know, the people saying, look, this is no, you know, please stop making jokes out of this tired trope, et cetera. It was still pretty confined to uh, a relatively small group of people, uh, which were not necessarily the people driving who was buying tickets. So, you know, how much, for instance, Twitter outrage there is over X does not usually affect how many tickets are being sold. And so the, the Tootsie closed, uh, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire closed. These, are, these did not get to run forever. Uh, and not necessarily because of outrage or because of anger, but because of disinterest, because of a, a sense that I, I think, as Adam is pointing out, a sense of possibly this is a little tired. Right. So I, I think that those are the things that they will have to contend with, is making something that feels fresh and exciting and new and, and vibrant, uh, as opposed to something that feels like 
either it is in conversation with <laughs> its critics, its hypothetical critics, or in conversation with, with uh, you know, a trope which has, as you say, been very, very familiar on Broadway. Jan, uh, just to gauge your disinterest in some like, <laughs> and then I want to go directly to plays uh, so that we can get your play, your play in that you started uh, perhaps wanting to talk about. Um, <laughs> Your disinterest or interest in some like it hot? Could you gauge it on a scale of one to ten? <laughs> um, I worship at uh, the temple of Billy Wilder, so I love all of his movies, and I love that movie. I don't know that I need to see it. They obviously made a musical out of Sunset Boulevard. They asked him after Sunset, uh, after he saw Sunset Boulevard, what he thought of the musical of Sunset Boulevard, and he said it was great. It was my yeah, I wrote it, <laughs> you know, because he ba they basically took his script and put it on stage. What play are you looking forward to uh, that's coming up? Uh, I think there are a lot of plays. Um, mainly off Broadway, but on Broadway, the play that I'm I'm most looking forward to seeing is uh, Ohio State Murders, mm -hmm. and it's by Adrian Kennedy, who uh, is a playwright who has been making plays for decades. She is now 91, and this is going to be her Broadway debut. Um, Audra McDonald is mm -hmm. going to star in the play, and it's a story about um, uh, a black female professor who is giving a talk about why there is so much violence in her work. And it's a, a play a, about um, how violence moves from generation to generation and, and, and how we uh, cope with it or don't. Um, but I'm most excited because it's Adrian Kennedy's debut. And a 1992 play at that. I mean, it's amazing it's taken this long to get to Broadway. So, but better late than never. Yeah. <laughs> Helen, what are you most looking forward to? Plan Broadway. Plan Broadway that is coming up that I am excited about. Uh, well, I would say the Top Dog Underdog uh -huh. revival. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I, I worry that this is a mark of how uh, old and creaky I'm getting because so much of my, <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure is spent in looking backwards. So, uh, again, Top Dog, Underdog, the original production on Broadway is one of the first Broadway productions that I saw when I came to the city. You know, I, I, uh, it, was, it was a total earthquake in my cultural life. And the idea that we get to see it again is, is very thrilling for me. Uh, we're also in this kind of the year of Susan Laurie Parks. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she's uh, has, I, I think, 50,000 shows happening. <laughs> I think it's like three shows at the public and a show on Broadway. She's going to be in her own production that will be at Joe's Pub. I mean, it is just, you know, you cannot swing a cat in this town. And I think that it's very interesting and very telling that a lot of the, the work that we're going to be seeing is... Uh, is her work. I think she is kind of, you know, you know, candidate for great American playwright, capital G. One of the five Pulitzers uh, this yes. fall. Yes. We should say that it's about, uh, it's called a two-hander. It's a, a two-person play, two-actor play. Mm. One is Booth, one is Lincoln. Mm. The one who plays Lincoln uh, plays Lincoln in an arcade in Whiteface where patrons are paid to assassinate him. Mm. Mm. His brother, uh, is um, a sort of petty thief um, and is trying to convince his brother to do a three Monty cards mm. scam or a three card Monty scam. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a very compelling one act, I think, play. And she wrote it after uh, being taught to play three card Monty. Ah. <laughs> and the play itself has in its Dramaturgy, a word I swore I would not utter. <laughs> uh, the the sort of the trickery of find the queen, find the queen, find the queen, and it is, uh, it is a very elegant piece of writing to begin with. It is also uh, pretty unconventional in that it is um, it is her the the mind that is working in it is a very experimental mind. And we talked about 
the stress of last season, which because last season was so vulnerable and was so sort of, how is this going to go? And what we had was a whole bunch of experimental shows that would very, very rarely be seen on Broadway. So we, we talked about them in our earlier meeting of uh, Is This a Room and, and uh, uh, Passover. And Passover and Dana H. H, exactly. And that I know that I felt kind of nervous at the end of last year. I thought, you know, is that did we have that little pocket of time where that kind of work made it to Broadway, and now we're going to go back to normal? And the return of Top Dog Underdog kind of reminds me that normal always included this kind of experimental and exciting work. We don't get a lot of it, but it is it is there, and uh, it's there for us to see, and, and I think it's a great sign that it's coming to the season. Great, and that's one of five black theme plays that are part of this season. It's hard to say what is black themed exactly mm -hmm. because so many of the shows that aren't necessarily specifically about black people or you know will still have elements that engage with those questions. We have a revival this year of um, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, 1949 Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, not traditionally about a black family. This production is about a black family. In those days, there was personality in it, Howard. There was respect and comradeship and gratitude in it. Today it's all cut and dry. There's no chance of bringing friendship to bear. All personality, you see what I mean? They don't know me anymore. His name was never in the paper. He's not the finest character that ever lived. But he's a human being. And a terrible thing is happening to him. So attention must be paid. He's not to be allowed to fall into his grave like, like an old dog. Attention, attention must be finally paid to such a person. You know, it's not just one actor uh, racially blindly cast, it's the, the entire family is being made, uh, reconceived as a, an African-American family, as far as I understand. Uh, also, we have revivals of Piano Lesson and Top Dog Underdog, which are two other Pulitzer Prize winners by black writers about black people. And then you have two other Pulitzer Prize winners between Riverside and Crazy and Cost of Living, both of which prominently feature black characters, although they're by white authors. So the, um, it's, 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 it's tricky to say what, in, and Ohio State Murders, of course. Ain't No More. Uh, and Ain't No Mo. Uh, both of which are re revivals in a sense, but are, have never been on Broadway before. So. Uh, we're seeing, last year there was a lot of talk about how many black playwrights and black artists were on Broadway in the fall. Uh, this year we're seeing that again, but we're seeing a, a slightly more careful version of that, where we're having tested <laughs> uh, uh -huh. properties, you know, that, which have the imprimatur of the culture already on them in many cases, or that we've seen, uh, you know, well-reviewed productions of recently. Fun fact about Death of a Salesman, the 1975 revival, and I hope I won't be contradicted in this, <laughs> but um, it was directed by George C. Scott, who wanted The Next Door Neighbor to be played by a black actor. Uh, and Arthur Miller said, no, under no circumstances can you. So George C. Scott said, fine, I just won't direct this play. Um, and he backed down, and it was played by Arthur French, and later by... Uh, Robert um, uh, Earl Jones, James Earl Jones' father. And now we have a James Earl Jones theater. Uh, Leopoldstadt is a major play coming in the fall. Now, which of you children has a question to ask? Go on, darling, ask Grandma anything you like. It's a Seder, Gretel, not ask me another. Vilma. Yes, Pauli? Why is this night different from all other nights? Why on this night do we not eat bread as normally, only matzah? Shebechol halelot, anu ochlin chametzu matzah, chametzu matzah. Halayla hazeh, halayla hazeh, kulo matzah. Halayla hazeh, halayla hazeh, kulo. 
50 years ago, you couldn't get a foot in. You couldn't travel without a permit. You couldn't get a bed for the night in village or town except in the Jewish quarter. And if you lived in Vienna, you lived in Leopoldstadt. You wore a yellow patch and, and, and stepped off the pavement to make way for an Austrian. <laughs> By all that's holy, it's happened in one lifetime. My grandfather wore a kaftan. My father went to the opera in a top hat, and I have the singers to dinner. Actors, writers, musicians. We buy the books, we look at the paintings, we go to the theater, the restaurant. We employ music teachers for our children. A new writer, if he's a great poet, like uh, Hoffmannstahl, walks among us like a demigod. We literally worship culture. And when we make money, that's what the money is for to put us at the beating heart of Viennese culture. This is the promised land. Perhaps uh, Tom Stoppard's last play, and about Tom Stoppard's family of sorts. It, it spans over seven decades of a Jewish family in Vienna. Uh, and it was only I, relatively recently or well into his age that Tom Stoppard discovered that he was fully Jewish and consequently wrote this play uh, it's been in London. What do we know about it? What, uh, Jan, do you, do you know much about Leopold Stott? And are you looking forward to it? I'm very much looking forward to it. I think that would be my second uh, mm -hmm. uh, choice um, um, among the plays. Um, that period of history, um, the way that um, particularly upper class, very acculturated uh, Jews, negotiated the rise of uh, Hitler um, is fascinating. And, and Stop It Writes Big, big cast. I'm really, I'm really interested in seeing. Uh, it, it also seems from what I've read, I have not seen it, that he is um, writing from the heart more than from the head, which is where his plays are so cerebral. Um, uh, when Coast of Utopia ran, um, the New York Times put out a reading list before <laughs> the play, um, which frightened my husband off. He went, no, I'm not studying to see a play. Um, this one, I think you can just really go in um, and in a visceral sense, live this this life in this very fraught time with this family. Well, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it too, not just because Tom Stoppard is one of my favorite playwrights, but also because, you know, uh, productions on this scale are usually reserved for musicals on Broadway because they're very expensive. And because Tom Stoppard is Tom Stoppard and he's in his 80s and who knows how many more original plays he's gonna be bringing to Broadway, uh, there, there's a willingness to go all out on this. And so you have, an, a, a, as you say, a show that spans Six many decades, decades uh, with an enormous cast on stage with the period costumes. And uh, that used to be true of so many Broadway plays where, you know, you look at the cast lists of plays from the 30s and 40s and there are dozens of people in the cast. And for various reasons, that's no longer the case. Even the things that we get, revivals of the classics, like, you know, Top Dog Underdog is a terrific play, it's two people. Mm. Um, Cost of Living, which won the Pulitzer yeah. a few years ago, four people. Mm. So these are the scale of plays that we usually get. And I love seeing it. I, I love seeing plays that have this breadth of scope. So I, I'm looking forward to it, if only on that basis, and I hope that there will be many other things that I like about it as well. Before we go on to Off-Broadway, uh, I just wanted to give a special mention to Ain't No Mo mm -hmm. by Jordan E. Cooper, who's a young playwright, and it is about, his concept is sort of a fantasy about when the U.S. government uh, gives free uh, airplane tickets to every black that wants to, to go back to Africa. And the, what's lovely about it is that he pays a you know, great uh, debt to George C. Wolfe and the Colored Museum, which of course started at the public theater, and this place started at the public theater mm -hmm. as well. Did anybody happen to see it? Uh, I, think we uh, I did, it. yeah. I think we yeah. all did, yeah. Oh, you yeah, all did? Yeah. Yeah. And, and just give us the, the greatest hits from it, if you will, uh, what you sort of thought about it, and then we'll go on to Off-Broadway. Uh, it is, I, I will say that I am both hugely looking forward to it 
and a little nervous because my experience of it at the public was so intense and so based on how small the room was. And the, the, the theater that they happen to be using inside the public is, is one of the theaters that looks most like a room that has been repurposed from some other function. And that there was a kind of secret secretiveness to it as though this show had there there is literally a, a plane that is on stage <laughs> and it was as if the show had kind of crashed through the ceiling and was happening and was going to have to very quickly like run out the door there was this there was a very the, do you know what i'm talking about this kind of like excitement of of sort of guerrilla performance mm. can you maintain that uh in you know one of the you know, Beaux Arts <laughs> theaters <laughs> on Broadway. I don't know, and I'm excited to see what it what it looks like on a grander scale. But that was it. it really did feel like, you know, this is a this is a show that it is not asking for permission. It is not even asking for forgiveness. It is just smash and grabbing what it can. And I loved that about it off Broadway. It's flight sixteen nineteen. We yes. should say yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, Quickly, it's, it's, um, I, I, I loved it off Broadway. And yeah. I, but I agree. I agree with Helen. It will be interesting. You know, when these shows, these off Broadway shows, transfer, and this is going to be certainly true of K-pop as well, uh, or even Ohio State. You know, these mm. shows that are conceived for a different um, mm -hmm. space in some sense. Uh, how will they work? I, Dana H. I thought worked great on Broadway, but no one saw it. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how these things transfer. Yeah. What impressed you most about Ain't No More? Um, he's a fresh young voice. Um, and so I'm happy to see that, you know, most of the plays that are being done either have a Pulitzer or they have a famous name behind them. And the idea of having a fresh young talent, I think he's what, like 28? Yeah. yeah. Something Very like young. that. That's exciting. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Off Broadway. Yeah. What are you most excited about? coming down the pike this fall from Off-Broadway. Jan? Oh, that's so hard because um, most of the, uh, Off-Broadway does so many plays. Um, there's one that's coming from um, Bess Wall that's uh -huh. being directed by David Cromer. Mm. Yep, it's um, called Camp, Camp Siegfried. And, just those two names. I mean, I'll go see anything that Bess Wall um, uh, writes, and I'll go see anything that David Cromer The directs. subject matter is fascinating. It's, it, a lot of people don't know this part of American history, but uh, during World War II and, and on the way up to World War II, there was a lot of pro-German Nazi sentiment in the United States, and there were actual camps um, in Long Island. Summer camps. Camp, see, summer camps, thank you. <laughs> in Long Island, yes. <laughs> Thanks for that distinction. Yeah. Summer camps in Long Island that basically put youth together and indoctrinated them in pro-German uh, propaganda and pro-Nazi propaganda as well, as if though they're, you know, they were Nazi Jungen, uh, you know, in a way. So it's a fascinating subject matter. I read the play. I can hardly wait to see it as well. Adam. Oh boy, there's so many new plays coming by people like Will Arbery and Sarah Rule and, you know, really, again, proven talents and also a lot of revivals. There's a Raisin in the Sun, like we're talking about black yeah. plays, they're doing that at the public with Tanya Pinkins and so, you know, there's a lot of stuff to look forward to. But as a, as a musical theater boy, I have to admit I'm really kind of psyched to see what they're going to try to do with Merrily We Roll Along again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to be the hardest ticket to get in New York for a while. It's at New York Theatre Workshop, and it stars Daniel Radcliffe and Jonathan Groff. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, so, Lindsay Mendez. and Lindsay Mendez, who is fabulous, um, but perhaps less of a draw to the general <laughs> public. Um, I, it's, I, it's going to be an enormous hit. Uh, but it, it, it's a show that I've seen now. Uh, I've seen many people try to make it work. Uh, and it's a strange show because- Has it ever worked? Well, not entirely. Well, yeah, I think it does work for a lot of people. But, you know, this is Stephen Sondheim's one of his greatest flops. Uh, it ran for, you know, a few performances in the early 80s. Uh, and they've been trying to change it ever since. But because of the structure of the show, and if people may know, it, it goes backward. Mm -hmm forward, so it's front, back to front, so it starts at the end when the, all the characters are hateful and miserable, and then it, it traces us back nostalgically to their youth and idealism. The, the, 
they've had a hard time making that work since it started. And but the, but now there are so many people who know the show anyway from the cast recording and from other productions. And once you know the show, the show kind of works in a different way because mm -hmm. you are already mm -hmm. invested in the characters and you, you already know where it's going. And so you feel that nostalgia even in the first scenes that traditionally haven't worked for new audiences. So, I, so people who are going to see this show, I bet, will be moved by it. Um, I mean, so it's a curious thing. Yeah. It's a show that works yeah. if you already know the show. Mm. Yeah, I've always found it emotionless. I, that, that by virtue of its structure, I just don't find it moving as, it, as I want it to be. The, if I just listen to the music itself, I find it very moving, but the show itself just doesn't work. Well, we'll see. Helen, yeah. one, one last. Um, if, you, if you want to wring yourself into a, a soggy washcloth, though, watch the documentary about it, <laughs> yeah. which is just shattering. Um, what is it called? The best is that the best worst thing that ever happened? Yes. Oh, it's incredible. Uh, so I'm so glad that that's what Adam said because we were fighting beforehand over who would say "Catch as Catch Can," which is a show coming to playwrights. Uh, Adam and I, I think, saw it together at the New Ohio. Did we, or, or or maybe For one night apart way. or something. Yeah. I'm coming home, baby. And it is a, it is impossible to describe. It's by <laughs> Mia Chung. It's a superb piece of text. It is, uh, it is full of sort of the slippage of reality is you think you are in one scene, but in fact, the dialogue from another scene is happening simultaneously. It is, it is, it, unbelievably elegant and clever and very funny and sad. <laughs> and the seeing it way, you know, uh, off Broadway at the New Ohio in a space, you know, uh, exactly the size of this coffee table uh, was was rewarding and thrilling. And you felt, you know, it's it's the one that got away. You know, you would tell people about it. Oh, you didn't see it, but it was amazing. <laughs> And here it comes. It's coming to playwrights. And so great. Well, we're very such lucky. A, such a great show. But one thing that, that, that's going to be interesting about this new production is it's a totally new yeah. production. It's not yeah. the same director, not the same cast. And I, I, and the Mia Chung wrote the play, but the play is not about Asian characters, or rather there are Asian side characters in it, but they're not the, the main characters in it. In this, it's being the entire cast in this play is Asian American and so it's going to give it an interesting uh, possibly an interesting twist in a play that already very much is about actors playing different genders different ages different types <clears throat> the same actors moving among roles and so uh, that will give it an extra twist and an extra turn of the screw I love this play it's well great. we love we love second chances we love second chances to <laughs> see a play we love second chances uh, uh, plays about second chances and we really like first chances. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. We barely dipped into so much <laughs> oh. of this season, but I think it was an amuse bouche, if we could say so. <laughs> Did we mention good... every Broadway play? Oh, Gabriel Byrne. We didn't mention Gabriel, Gabriel Byrne. Byrne has a has a, a wonderful play and so. a wonderful. And between act. Riverside and Crazy, which oh. which is a superb show. Superb. We already know is a brilliant piece of writing. Pulitzer Prize. Another, Another Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize, Prize winner. Uh, yeah. By Stephen Adley Gerges. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we got the mention. Keep it in. Keep it in. <laughs> <laughs> Please keep it in. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your expert opinions um, <laughs> and your opinionated, <laughs> your opinionated evaluations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and professionals as New York Theatre, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.